Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name's John Osage, and I work with ExxonMobil. My colleague, Ebony Webbington, stand, stand, stand. Oh, okay. she's, actually, she's actually the one who's in charge of this project. So if there's anything you didn't like, <laughs> right there. <laughs> All right. Let me tell you a little bit about where we work. Ebony and I, we both work for what we call the Data Quality Center of Excellence for ExxonMobil. Our job is to partner with various portions of the upstream, which is a large organization, to implement, to identify and implement, and to progress and move out data quality processes that will ensure high quality data in our corporate repositories. Why is quality important? Let me just kind of paint a picture that I'm sure a lot of you can identify with. What happens if you're working and all of a sudden your boss comes up and says, hey, I need this report. You think, no problem, I've got a dashboard built. I can go ahead and I can just get him an answer real fast. You look at that answer, and it wasn't what you were expecting. It looks a little bit off. So you start looking into the data, and you realize not all the data is there. You look a little closer. Some of it's not coded correctly. Some of it's missing key attributes. Well, you don't realize it at the time because you're under a lot of stress trying to get something done, but that data is controlling you. And if you want to be competitive in today's environment, you need to control the data. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. We got some takeaways. One, we want to talk about Tableau functionality and how we use it to monitor, measure, and manage the quality of our data. Second, we want to look at business rules. We want to determine how we can write those and how we can go from a complex environment to a simple environment. And finally, we want to look at, dash, not dashboards, but we want to look at the tablets like iPad and all of that, how you can start using your information and carry it right there in the palm of your hand. So with that being said, I'm going to start with the end in mind and I'm going to show you one of our dashboards. Now you may look at this and it just may not look like a lot of the dashboards you've seen so far at the conference. What's missing? There are no bar charts, no scatter plots, no diagrams like that. All we really have is a map, and what we're looking at is the Gulf of Mexico. Those dots represent well locations. We're going to be talking about well data. This is a dummy data set. At the bottom on the left, our dashboard has a spreadsheet, and this was built in Tableau. And all it simply is, is just a lot of the key information that we need. And then on the upper right, and this was a really big addition, is our interactive data filters. Now what you're here today to see is what's on the lower left, and that's our data quality metrics. Let me blow that up for you. This is how we monitor and manage the quality of our databases. This is just an example. We use Tableau to get in and look at the data. So instead of taking that information, pulling it out, and making all kind of decisions and trend analysis, we're using Tableau to look within the data. We want to know how good that data is. And we can do that by writing things called business rules. Do we have a lot? Of, are there a lot of people in the room that deal with data quality? Oh, excellent. Great. So when we write those business rules, we run against our data. And this is just validity. So what we're looking at for a series of um, attributes, whether or not that data is valid or invalid. And of course, we all know the great thing about dashboarding. You can take your cursor and move it over those numbers, and the error report pops up. So what we're going to be talking about today is how we got those metrics. So I've kind of started with the end in mind. So what we did is we started building these, and we rolled them out. Now, we had a summer intern. This guy knew nothing about Tableau, had never even heard of it. And, he, and his job was to go out and work with our end users, our geologists, our geophysicists, our engineers. He focused primarily on the Gulf of Mexico. And what he did is he went and talked to them. He showed them the dashboard we had developed. He said, guys, how can I make this better? What can I do? And they start telling him, well, we'd really like to see the business rules. So if you look on the upper right-hand side where it says designated business rules, and we'll get in a little bit more about this, we have a hierarchical data set. And once again, geology data, well level, log level, curve level. I'll explain what that means in a minute. 
So on the right-hand side, you can see the rules. On the left-hand side, he shows the results of what happens when he runs the rules against the data. And if it passes at 100%, he shows nothing. So if you look at the top one where it's on the right-hand side where it says, well, UWI must be unique. And then over here on the left-hand side at well level, he says, UWI not unique, 11%. So 11% of our data is not unique. I'll get into a minute what that means. Our end users, they didn't really need to see a big spreadsheet, and they didn't really need to see a big map. So the dashboard I just previously showed you, all that information that was on our dashboard, he captured in four lines. So this was a great way to illustrate the quality of your data over a given area. Now there's a lot of information here. And what happens is you gotta remember your audience. So what they wanted was a way if we could just sum up all that information and come up with one number that represents the data quality. Now if you look on the top where it says select protraction area, that's our filter. And in the Gulf of, Me in the Gulf of Mexico, the data is broken out by Staco Refnos, basically. And this is um, 60811, that just means it's in the offshore Gulf of Mexico. So what he did when he heard that is he went out to ArcGIS and he pulled in some polygons and he plotted them on a map. Now what this map shows is the outline of Gulf of Mexico and each one of these blocks is what's called a lease block. Now here's how oil and gas exploration works in the Gulf of Mexico. Those are owned by the government. The government decides which one of those blocks they want to open up for bids and then they do. Oil companies come in, they do research on those areas and decide if they think that's a hydrocarbon prone area. If they do, they bid on the block and try to win it so they can drill it and develop it. Okay, so how do we take all our information over all those business rules and combine them and make it easy to read? What our summer intern did is he just converted it to color. He took the summation number for all the blocks, he put on a color code at the bottom, red being the worst or the lowest, highest being green, and he plotted the color. So what this shows you right away that you can see where all your good data is and all your bad data is. The one thing that you can really give your management that they want is time. If you can save them time in making a decision, you're doing a good job. Management can look at this and real fast decide whether or not they think their data is of quality over a given lease block, whether or not we need to clean up the data or it's good to go or we can make an evaluation. So these are our dashboards that we have built to monitor and measure data quality. So how did we get there? Now we're gonna go back and look at the actual overview of this talk. I'm gonna start and talk a little bit about what is geologic data and how we get it. And then from there we're gonna look at ExxonMobil's data quality journal and then we're gonna talk about dashboards. And then I'll end up my part of the presentation with rollout where we talk about our agile approach. Ebony will come up, talk about the live demo, give a live demo, and talk about what we learned as we rolled out what we built to our upstream partners and end with a conclusion. So let's go ahead. Now, how many people have ever wondered when you see an oil rig out on the distance, how do they know to drill it there? So here you go. This is just a simple schematic, and what you can see is basically a hydrocarbon trap. And that's where we're gonna drill and generate some data. What I wanna show very shortly is how those traps are formed. And I'm just gonna use my notes, I'm gonna give a little example here about Structural Geology 101. And as you can see, I got several sheets of paper here. And just imagine that this paper is a bed of rock, just a layer of rock. And the earth is not very quiet, it's very dynamic. It's undergoing a lot of forces. One of the forces are compressional forces. So if I would take this flat layer of rock and apply compression, it bows up. Geologists call that an anticline. That's what you see right there. Those lower layers, they undergone compression, they bowed up, and we formed what we call a hydrocarbon trap. Now there are a lot more traps than just structural traps, but this was just an illustration. We're really here to talk about data. So let's do that. I drill this hole, that's what the black line is, coming down into our hydrocarbon trap. But 
How do we get our information? What kind of information do we need? Well, I'm mostly a log guy. So what is a log? Here's a curve. A curve is nothing more than point-to-point -point representation of the subsurface based on the tool you're doing the measuring. So this is a gamma ray. And this gamma ray is recording as I go down the hole, and it's making a recording of that rock. Because we can't go down the hole. We think we knew what we drilled, but until we actually see the data, we don't know. And you actually run more than one tool. We can run a series of tools. These curves are called a log suite. What I'm trying to do is get you familiar with the data we're dealing with. Now, so from a curve perspective, some of our key attributes that we're interested in is curve name, curve unit, depth unit, depth increment, things like that. We know we've got a log suite. Also, we've got well information, whether or not what the well name is, it's unique, yep, unique well identifier, one unique name for every well in the world. And we have a little bit of information about the log type. And to finish it all off, let's look at some actual digits. These are digits for the curves, and you plot those, and you get that over there. This is the type of data we're dealing with. I just wanted to give a quick overview as to when we start talking about different attribute names, you get an idea of what we're talking about. Okay, that was a simple explanation. Let's look at the real world. On the left-hand side, you see something called sidetrack data. In the illustration, we just showed a single borehole. Very easy, easy to follow. But if you stop and think about it, when we punch a hole in the ground, it's very, very expensive. So we try to get as many holes into the reservoir rock as humanly possible so we can recover as quickly as we can the hydrocarbons. So we call those sidetracks and we drill a bunch of them. And it's kind of distorted from the view here, but all of those kind of end at the same depth. So we have to make sure we can monitor all that and keep all that straight. Along the way, we have multiple repositories. On the lower right-hand side, you can see something called our log curve header. That's what we just put all the information I showed you on the previous slide. And then on the left-hand side, we have the well header. That has information about the well itself and information about the formation, about porosity and permeability and so forth like that. And remember I told you about the UWI. And I got an arrow connecting our two repositories, our well header and a log curve header. The way they talk back and forth is with the UWI. If the UWIs aren't the same, they can't communicate back and forth because I take log header information, information, put it in the well header, and I take well header information and put it into the log curve header. And there's a really good reason for that. So we have to make sure that UWI is equivalent in both places. So that's one of our tests. Okay, that's it for Geology 101. Let's start talking about quality. Now, I've been to a lot of quality classes and I also went out and talked to a lot of people about quality. And you can come up with a tremendous amount of definitions. I look out in this room and it's fairly packed. I bet we got at least 130 people here. And I bet if I ask every one of you just to quickly write down what is data quality without looking at that definition up there, I probably have 130 different answers. Or we could start cl clustering some of them together that kind of were alike. The idea is how can we come up with a simple definition for data quality that people remember? Because if you can't remember it, how good is it? So when I went out and talked to people, only a couple of things really became clear our end users expect to be able to find the data and expect to be able to trust the data. Thus, our definition, the degree to which the data meets the ex expectations of our customers. So how do we measure for data quality? Well, there are these things called characteristics. And let's just go back to my unique well identifier. And in my unique well identifier, I know that it has to be complete. It has to be populated. That field can't be blank. I know it has to be unique. It can't be duplicated. And I also know it must be equivalent. It has to be in one of my repositories and the other. So knowing that, those characteristics, I can call those the quality characteristics of that attribute, UWI. I can take that and turn it into a sentence. A UWI must be complete, must be unique, and it must be equivalent. We take that sentence, convert it to SQL from the SQL against our database, and it puts out the attributes that we bring into Tableau and generate the metrics. 
That's as easy as it, that's fairly easy, and that's how we test for data quality of the data. The challenge becomes identifying your key attributes and tagging them with the correct quality characteristics. Once you do that, you're pretty much home free. If you don't know SQL, if you don't know SQL, you might have to find a coder. But that's how we test for the quality of our data. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the ExxonMobil journey through data quality. If you ask everybody in any organization, oh yeah, we do quality, we've been doing it for a long time. ExxonMobil would say the same thing. But in 2007, we had a fundamental shift. We realized we needed to do more. That's when we start writing business rules. And the business rules went in, it monitored the data. Now, this was our first attempt at doing this. So we put a group of people together, they wrote some rules, we applied them to the data, we rolled it out to the world, and the people could start seeing the quality of their data, and then that's when the light bulbs went off, they started going back and cleaning their data. Well, success opens doors. And by that I mean, when people start seeing this and it start working over years, they wanted more. They wanted a lot more. They wanted to be able to start filtering their data. They wanted to be able to start really seeing it more so than just looking at a spreadsheet. There's all kind of things they wanted. So what happened is we rapidly outgrew our current application we used to monitor data quality. Thus, a team was formed between Ebony and myself where we were gonna go out, research different applications, identify one that we thought would really do the job for ExxonMobil, and we decided Tableau was the one to use. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the business rules. And these are things that we improved upon our original move through data quality to what we're currently doing today. And what our users wanted, and there were basically three things, and this is just the first one, they wanted more hands-on more hands capability. We talk about writing business rules, they not only wanted to see them, they wanted to write their own. So we needed to have some sort of very easy interactive pl place where they could get in, start writing their own rules, and running against the data. They also wanted summation business rules. You saw an example of that on one of my original slides when we showed what our summer intern did where he took all the metrics, added them together, and put out one number. And then we wanted the date range filter. This one's pretty big. And if there's anyone in the room that has a better word for time forward data than what I'm using, catch me after the talk and let me know. Because here's what I'm referring to this with the date range filter. When it comes to cleaning up data, which isn't cheap, by the way, the question becomes, who's responsible for it? Who cleans it up? And basically, we have two types of data in the repository. One I call legacy data. That's data that's been around quite some time, right? It's the, one that, it's the stuff that was there before any quality rules were ever invented. That's the stuff that really needs the cleaning. So you go out and you clean it up. It's good. Well, along comes more data coming in. If you don't have a process to ensure quality, you're just mucking up your database. You're putting more bad data in over clean data. So I've coined the term time forward data. And what that means is the new data that's being loaded in must also be of high quality. So we have processes in place, or we're trying to get processes in place, that as we load the data in, we check it for quality, and they move it over into our corporate repository. So this actually kind of constitutes kind of a big deal because cleanup isn't cheap. And does the data owner clean it up or the person that loaded it who didn't do it right clean it up? By having a date range filter, very easy to determine that. And we can go ahead and then work with the people who made the mistake. Now here's the way it works. If somebody loads data and they don't do it right, we can go in and identify who that is. Do we chastise them? No, not at all. What you wanna do is you wanna work with them to make sure the process is right. Fix the process, in other words, correct the bust, Go out and make sure everybody who loads data understands that you made a change. So you can continually learn from your mistakes, grow and get better. Okay, the increased functionality. They wanted the interactive capabilities. They want to get in and they want to make business rules. They love filtering. They want to get in and change dates. They want to get in and change locations, change attributes. That's why we had nine filters on our dashboard that you saw. And then what they have, attribute data sets. Rarely when you deal in the real world will one attribute be sufficient to identify what you're looking for. Let's just take the case of a well. When you saw all those deviated holes that we showed in that example, 
you need what we call a directional survey to really know where you are in the subsurface. So what good is a well if I don't know where the borehole is? So you really need to have that directional survey. So when they mean attribute data sets, they want to capture key information from that directional survey, they want to tie it to the well, they want to pick up location, and they want to know, do I have all of this? You can, Ebony has written dashboards that do that. So then when they go into an area and they want to work, they can go ahead and grab the data specifically that's ready to go, just like that. Okay, business rules. Big learning that we had on business rules. I already said that in the past, when we did business rules, we just wrote them for everybody, and then they had to live with them. One of our takeaways from our first attempt at data quality was there's a better way. So if you look at the pyramid, the top half, which is colored red, we call those global rules. On the bottom half that's green, site-specific rules. So what Ebony and I did is we focused on the global rules. And those global rules were the easy attributes, completeness, validity, uniqueness, equivalent. And we wrote those rules, and then they can apply those to their databases. And, they can, and, and by doing that, they'll be able to find their data. And if they can't, they know where it's wrong, fix it so they can get their hands on it. Once they're able to find their data, they're ready to go to start their site-specific rules. And a site-specific rule is just that. I'm not a data, qual a, a data subject expert on their area. They are. They know what they're looking for. There may be porosity cutoffs, permeability issues, flow rates, whatever it is. I don't know that. They do. When we roll out our, pro our program, we teach them Tableau. We teach them how to write business rules so they can find their data and then they can fine tune it themselves. This was huge. This one really helped a lot. And then we just go down to data dependent. Okay, this is kind of a summary slide of what we talked about so far. I call it the complex data environment. We've got our sidetrack, and this is just a hierarchical database on the right-hand side with the well, log, and curve. We talk about multiple business rules, maps and spreadsheets, our filtering capabilities. It's kind of hard to keep track of all that. You want a way. So when I say complex, I mean this is complexity. This is simplicity. This is how we do that. Everything you saw on the last slide, we just converted over here and brought them into the metrics. So they don't have to deal with that stuff anymore. They can get right to the good stuff, and that's what they're interested in. They want to know the quality of their data and if they need to clean it up. Okay, understanding the metrics. Here's something that happened. We went ahead in our first time when we did data quality, and we put out all these reports and what we heard was, I mean, my data is like 95%. That's good. I shouldn't have to worry about it. Who's worrying about 5%? You know, that validity, that valid log name thing, I don't even know if I need to worry about that. So why should I care? So what we did is we put together this slide. And this slide is on a dashboard. It explains what validity is. We go through and isolate every attribute that needs to be tested for validity, and we even talk about some of the rules themselves, like if I have an invalid log type, how does that hurt me? If I have an invalid curve count, now I told you a log is a suite of curves. What happens if one of those logs have no curves? It adds no value. Delete it. That's what we tell them basically to do. Now, I've been at the conference since Monday and we're always learning. And what I have learned at the conference is storytelling. This and this. Go from here, go to there. This is a beautiful example where storytelling can come in. I can combine those slides, I can tell a wonderful story, and I can do it not only all on one slide, but I can bring up multiple examples of different quality characteristics just by like combining those two guys, just like that. Now, can I show you that? No, I just learned it here at the conference, so I gotta go back and build it. But you can bet that's what I'm gonna do. And it's gonna really add a lot of value. So, so the point I'm trying to make is, this is basically cutting edge stuff. The stuff I showed you with our summer intern, 
That was just done two months ago. So we're right on the cusp here. Okay, we build all our dashboards. What do we do with them? Okay, we have this thing called our gallery of dashboards and I have six of them shown there. What we do is we put our dashboards out on the server and then when we train our end users and data consumers, we give them access to this. They go out, they get these dashboards, they download them onto their site, they can do whatever they want to with them, just like that. And when they're done, if they're good, we want to see them again, we want to talk to them. Now, so that's how we use our gallery. It's just a great place to store our dashboards. We put them out for the world to see, and they can download them and do whatever they want to with them. Okay, so let's look at a dashboard life cycle. The business downloads it, then they go ahead and make their changes. They like what they've done. They show it to us, Ebony and I. If it has global significance, we can go ahead, take that, clean up the SQL a little bit, and publish it in our dashboard. Think about it. I've got an interpreter working in Australia who really stumbled across something or worked hard and came up with something really good. He gives it to us, we put it on the dashboard. Now somebody in EMIL, somebody in Buenos Aires, wherever we have an Exxon office can use that information. Now, I've got a good story about this. And speaking of BA, that's exactly what we're gonna talk about. In BA, we rolled out this information and this is where our data loaders are. And we showed them all the key characteristics they need to be concerned about when they load data. So we rolled it out. We never heard back from them. We'd call them and they'd home, yeah, yeah, all right. So a couple of weeks went by. So we called them again and they said, well, you know, we built a dashboard. I said, we said, great, let's see it. So we called it up on the screen. Phenomenal. Didn't look anything like our dashboard. But boy, did it hit the nail on the head and it, wanted, it did everything they wanted. And then they said, you know what? This dashboard saves us 95% of our time. Now that, that's quite a statement. And I, and I know that that's probably true because I used to do what they did. Let me tell you their old process. And what they wanted to do is just generate reports and check the data quality. Here's how you generate a report. They went into the application which wasn't very user-friendly, extracted the report, once again, not very user-friendly, brought it into Excel, cleaned up all the spaces, cleaned up all the extra headers, cleaned up all the dashes. When it was done, they took it into Access, and that's where they wrote all their reports. Tableau, all that's gone. You have a direct hook up to your data, you get right in, you see it, answers are just like that. Saved them 95% of their time. Now that's a good success story. Okay, this is my last slide, and it talks about Agile rollout. And here we are, we've done all this work, and the question becomes, how do we get it out to the corporation? So what we've done is we attack the Agile approach. And that simply means is that as we start getting usable products, we go ahead and take them out and publish them and start training people. Now the key here is as we train, we listen. So they tell us what they need, they tell us what they like, what they don't like. We're constantly modifying, agile. If I waited to move everything out all at once, I'd never publish anything. But as we move along and reach success and publish our successes, we continue to grow. So that's our agile approach. And it's, once again, it's just round the loop, continuous communication, continuous communication. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ebony and she's gonna take you through a live demo and finish the talk. There you go. Good evening, everybody. Did, did any of you notice like a little smirk on Jan's face as she was presenting? Anybody? She had a little gate going with her to move it back. No? Now? Awesome. Okay. All right, let me just put this behind me. Oops, just one second. If I can get this. 
so much guys. Uh, okay, there we go. All righty. So again, my name is Ebony Weddington, and as John said, we've been working in this project for about a year and a half, and um, really been having an awesome time. It's been a really fun project. So what I'm going to do is just walk you through a brief demo, and again, it's going to be a, a, a good representation. Of course, we're going to be using dummy data because law wouldn't allow us to use actually real live data. So I'll walk you through a presentation, an actual demo. I'll take you through a few of the lessons learned that we found throughout this project, and then I'll conclude the presentation. All right? So just a little info on kind of what we'll look at within the live demo. So the first thing we'll look at is just kind of a sample data quality dashboard, and we saw one previously, but we'll just kind of walk through the actual workbook and some of the key components of it live so that you can see that piece. We'll talk a little bit about the standard design template that we use, and I know within Tableau we really we encourage kind of the free form and you kind of having this canvas that you can go into, but we found having a standard template worked really well for our end users. We'll talk a little bit about the, the benefits that we saw for actions and filtering and how just having that flexibility was just completely beneficial for our customers. And then we'll, I'll end the demo with kind of talking a little bit about the feedback that we received and how we were able to add and make changes to the dashboards based on that, those, that feedback. All right, so starting with the standard design template. So one thing that we found with Tableau, and I'm sure for all of the new users with Tableau, I know for us it was the same. Tableau is really fun, really exciting. There's a lot of functionality. And if you're not careful, you can spend hours upon hours getting engulfed in that functionality. And if you don't have some type of maybe go by or some, some requirements before you get in, you can just spend a lot of time just going through the functionality, trying to make things perfect, perfect acting as if you're in PowerPoint. So it's really nice we found to just have a go by for our end users. It was also good because if they don't have a go by, they can get to a point where you see something like this. And for us, it was just busy, just busyness. So we wanted to make sure that they kept it simple. They didn't get to a point where they had too much on one slide and it was just overwhelming. So we wanted to, again, give them some type of example to go by. And we found that it was, it was really great for our end users because they were able to take this from the server, as John mentioned earlier, download this into their own license, so they all had a Tableau desktop license, and make modifications. I mean, we had some that used this exact same template, but we had others that went off and created their own thing, but again, it was just having a go-by that they can use to kind of walk them through the process. So we found it to be very helpful. So I'm gonna get out of here, and I'm gonna be back and forth between my demo and um, the PowerPoint. So excuse me, I just got in here and my connection was bad. So can I get everybody just to imagine that this is, the, that the actual outline here was showing. So this is actually a map of the U.S. Again, this is dummy data. And the way we go about doing our dashboard, we have an Oracle database. How many of you have used Oracle with Tableau? Okay, awesome. So we are primarily for this project, we're looking at Oracle data. Um, we have business rules that have been transferred into SQL statements. So pretty much what I did for this demo, I again, this is a true representation. So I ran the report in Oracle, dumped that information to Excel, and just kind of did some tweaks to the data and got that passed through law. But as you see here within our workbook, and we talked about it, we have kind of key components of our workbook. So we have our map view here. We have our data form, which is ultimately just metadata about the data. So we have customers who you know, these are the, the main columns that they're wanting to see. And we have others that really don't. They want to add maybe, they don't need field name. So they can drag and drop as need be. Then we have these next few tabs, which are actually our quality metrics that I'm going to come back to and just show you a little bit about that. And then we have the actual dashboard tab. So again, fairly simple. Again, that's kind of the approach we wanted to take. We didn't want to get it too complex and convoluted. So that was the approach we took with the um, content. If you notice here in the dimensions area, you see a lot of different um, columns here. So you see country and field name, but you also see these that have maybe has underscore or unique underscore or valid underscore. And these are ultimately our business rule, the quality checks that we talked about. So if you see a has underscore ID will or surface location, that's a completeness check. That's checking to see if data is actually in our corporate repositories for that individual attribute. If you see uniqueness, we know that it's checking to make sure we don't have duplication. So we have checks in there for those attributes. And validity, we all know if there's some type of range that they want their data to be in, we know that it's doing a quality check to make sure that it's falling within that particular range. Now going back to our map view, which um, we're acting as if we see the outline here, 
Um, within our filters, one thing that we took advantage of within Tableau was the global filter option. And that was key for us because it allowed any changes that we made in one worksheet, it was going to automatically showcase in the other worksheet or even in the dashboard. So we took advantage of the global filtering options. Again, based on our end user, they determined what filters they wanted to have. But again, Tableau gives you that ease of use so you can you know, quickly drag and drop. We talked a little bit about our data form. Again, so that's just based on the end user's needs. Now moving into the metrics. So what we did with the metrics, again, which is the most important component of our workbook, you notice that we have these exact same um, attributes you see here, which we dragged and dropped. So for surface location, well reference elevation, and well reference elevation types, those are the three attributes that they wanted to do quality checks against for this particular data set for validity. Now we have ones and zeros. So pretty much we have four, four columns here. Of course, the one means that it passed the quality check. So if there was a zero here, it would say it would be those um, columns that did not pass the quality check. But our end users really didn't want to see a one or zero. So we changed that and we made the one where it's going to say valid. So we used that, the alias option in Tableau. They also wanted to be sure that um, they were able to see a percentage. You know, some of them didn't want to have a count. So we came in here to analysis and quickly just came to percentage and changed that to percentage. So that lets them know that their data is, uh, you know, 100% quality. So I'm going to do the same thing here with our reference elevation, just as simple as changing the alias. And we know that this is going to be invalid. So we had two records that um, fell outside of the range that they gave us for reference elevation. And this is our valid entries here. So we had 12. So if I come here and I go to analysis and do my percentage, we immediately it changes and we see that 85% were valid and 14% were invalid. Now, if I come to my dashboard again, we have, you know, ultimately you have a, a blank canvas that you can drag and drop, but I've already created one. And ultimately what you can see, I've just simply dragged and dropped the map, the data form and the quality metrics into a view. Um, we, this is a template that we're using, so I've gone in already, so the end user already has all of this fixed. The great part about this is that the end user, they can immediately download this from the server, of course just change the data connection. And if there's nothing, if they want to keep it that way, it's really nothing for them to do but to just change what database they want to point to, and it'll immediately change the number, so that's time saving within itself. But if I come here, we want to take a look at the metrics, and you notice right now that everything, so the surface location is showing 100%. All that. So if I come here and I filter and I took away this particular well identifier, a second. you notice that my map is changing. Okay, yeah, so my map changed. You notice that my data form changed because of the filtering and you notice that my my actual percentages for my metrics changed as well. So the great thing here is that our end users, they can immediately, they see these metrics, they're able to come here, they can look at what's invalid because that's ultimately probably what they're wanting gonna, they're wanting gonna look at. And they can use this error report as a reference for data cleanup. So they can dump this, whether it be into Microsoft Excel, CVS file, whatever you want, take that back and use that as a reference for data cleanup. And this piece has been which is, again, extremely beneficial for our end users because they now see immediately what are their problem areas and they can go back and clean up that data. Okay? So I'm going to get back into the presentation. Here. All right. So now we're going to just, a few minutes on just actions and filtering. Again, this was amazing, a, a really big change from my previous tool because end users, they did not have the ability to come in and customize. Our previous tool, there were, there were a lot of restraints. I mean, they had a still report, and if they wanted to go in and just say customize a business rule, they didn't have that functionality. So Tableau has enabled us to give end users, and ultimately they've given them power back. They have control and power over their data that they didn't have with our previous tools. So the filtering and the actions have really helped with that, that component. Now our original dashboard for rollout, one thing that we wanted to keep in mind with our rollout, we really wanted to provide excellent customer service. That was really key for us because the previous tool, again, there was just issues there and we kind of lost some trust there with the, the previous tool. So we wanted to make sure that during this particular rollout and with this tool, 
we regained that trust. We wanted to make sure that they understood that whatever feedback that they were giving us, that we were listening, that we were going to take that feedback and make changes based on the feedback that they gave us. So this was our original dashboard that you already saw. And this dashboard here is one that John talked about as well, but the feedback that they've given us, we've now taken our summer intern, Sergey came in, again, with no prior knowledge. He had one month, literally, one month to do this project. No prior Oracle experience. He didn't have any Tableau experience. He had no experience with our data. He was able to go out and interview the group, the Gulf of Mexico team, gather their requirements, whatever feedback that they gave, and he was able to produce this dashboard, which we thought was amazing. Um, this is now being used as a, the actual tool of choice for that team to monitor how they've been doing with their data cleanup efforts and also just data quality in the future, how they're going to monitor and measure the quality of data in the future. So that's been key. This individual dashboard here, again, where he's worked with our ArcGIS team, this was kind of his second project. He worked with the ArcGIS team to pull in these polygons because ultimately we've had a lot of energy in our company around ArcGIS and how can we take this geospatial data, put it into Tableau so that we can get the analytical component. So Sergey was able to kind of open that and, and kind of showcase that opportunity for us. Now management has the ability to see a summation. They can look at this lease block and they can tell, you know, instantaneously what's the quality of that data. You know, for the Platinum District, something I made up, they can see that it's 99%, you know, clean, the data itself. So we're able to make key business decisions. We're able to give management that time back and make these key decisions that are going to affect our corporation in the long term. Okay. So feedback has been vital. Now some of the lessons learned that we've, we've found, and it's been quite interesting, we've had a lot of lessons learned. So it took some time to try to consolidate a few just for this presentation. Um, but one of the key things that we found was performance was an issue for us in the very beginning. How many has had performance issues? Any? Are we the only culprits there? Okay, we had a, we had a lot of performance issues in the beginning, and, and at, at one point it became where our end users were like, uh, I don't know if we're going to want to use this, but we worked through it. We found that, of course, with some of your larger data sets, you run into issues and you have to find ways to, to try to tweak things to make performance better. Um, we found where we did some tests where we looked at, okay, well, we're going to try connecting with a custom SQL versus, say, Oracle Views, connecting directly to Oracle View. We found that to be helpful. We found performance was better with the Oracle views. Another thing that we had where you saw that previous dashboard, we had about six, seven filters. Filtering definitely impacts performance. So we had to go back to our customers and say, hey, do you really need six, seven filters? You know, can we narrow this down to maybe your top two that you need? And once we did that, that was another way to impact performance. So those were just some ways there. Um, live connections with Oracle. We currently have a very complex <laughs> security model. So currently our end users, they're not able to see a live data connection. If we publish these dashboards out to the server and we're connected to Oracle, we have to do a data extract. So we can't utilize the live connection piece and we're hoping based on the keynote that, um, that the Coboros enablement is going to allow us to do that. So we're trying to make sure that they get the Oracle piece done, but that was an issue too for us. Um, our end users, they want to see live up to the minute data. They don't want to do extracts. You know, but we had to kind of work with them to say, hey, we're, we're hoping that this is going to be fixed in the near future. So we've been able to do that. But right now we're restricted to Tableau Desktop as far as any type of live connection within um, Tableau. The importance of flexibility. This has been um, something that we, we've learned definitely throughout this rollout. Our end users, they don't want to hear that, okay, we need to wait to the very end of the project in order to get some things changed or if they have some key issues that they found in this dashboard. They don't want to hear that, okay, well, you know, after the rollout and maybe three months from now, we'll, we'll make that change. They want to see that we're listening to their feedback and we're able to do some things now. So having that agile approach, giving them the functionality with Tableau where they're able to go in and, and do things on their own, they don't have to wait on us. They can go in and make these changes. That has been key, and that has been, you know, just, again, rebuilding that trust with them. That's been vital there. Managing the feedback and enhancements from our end users, kind of going hand in hand. They've given us a lot of feedback, but we have to be careful that we're managing the critical versus the nice to have. Because if not, you'll find yourself spending so much time trying to recycle all of this stuff that, you know, the project is going to end at some point. So you have to be able to kind of manage how you're going to do the criticals versus nice to have. What we did was we prioritized. We had high, medium, and low priority items. 
everything that was high, that was kind of what we worked on. And the medium and low, we were working as we could get to it based on time and based on resources. So managing that is critical. And the importance of the follow-up period. So John made the comment that, you know, we, we had this meeting, we had um, our Buenos Aires colleagues who were a part of our rollout. We did the rollout with these guys and we never heard from them. What we started to do with each rollout, we had a 60 day follow-up period, 60 day, because we wanted to encourage uptake of these dashboards because we know what happens. We do training, people go back to their office and they don't use it. They have other issues that come up and they don't have time. So we, we scheduled bi-weekly meetings and which this was on their calendar. So it was kind of an incentive for them to get some stuff done because they know that we were gonna be having that meeting in two weeks. So we found that that was very, very helpful. We had those meetings, we were able to recycle, have additional feedback. It let us know that they were actually using Tableau. You know, you have to actually use the tool to have feedback. So they were using the tool. Um, we found that the, the BA group, they actually produced a new dashboard. And that's been one way that we've been able to measure the success of this project is if they're creating new dashboards that we can ultimately add to our gallery. So that's been key as well. And it's been kind of helping with the continuous feedback and collaboration that we've been wanting to do throughout this project. So Tableau throughout ExxonMobil. Um, we talked about data quality within Tableau and, and really this data quality initiative that we've been doing is, is something that was kind of just started um, with Tableau. We have an analytics COE within our organization in which we actually have a Tableau team um, that actually supports the server. Um, they do consulting work. So we've had you know, various people using Tableau throughout our company already. We are very, very, when it concerns safety, health, and environmental issues, safety is our core value. It's the most important thing to our corporation. When people come to work, we want to make sure that they leave and they're able to go home to their families and they're safe. So we have, um, within those parts of our organization, they utilize Tableau to look at, you know, if there are any type of lost time incidents, any type of safety-related metrics. They're using Tableau for a lot of those things, to look at those metrics. ArcGIS integration, like we said, we're, we're, we're very interested in how we can look at geospatial and analytics. That's been key. Data discovery. I mean, we spend a lot of money on data, a lot of money. So if we can prevent re repurchasing the same data that we think we have, that's, that's key. That's just instrumental. So we're using Tableau to look and see what data do we currently have in our corporate repository so that we're not going back and repurchasing that data. And then data analytics and key performance indicators. We're using Tableau in, in these particular parts of our organization. And this is just a few. I mean, there are other things that are going on that I, John and I may not even know of at this time. But those are just a few that we wanted to notate. So in conclusion, this is again our last slide. Um, our previous data quality tool, again, it, it presented barriers. There were business rules that were too global in scale. So it prevented our end users to really see the, the true meaning of their data. They weren't able to really zone in on their area of interest. Um, they wanted more flexibility. You know, they wanted to be able to bring back that power. They wanted intuitiveness. They didn't want anything that was too complex convoluted that they couldn't use. So we've been able to capitalize on the dashboard functionality to monitor, measure, and manage the quality of our actual data in our corporate repositories. We've moved from a more complex model that we were using before to a more simplistic approach, and that's been key. And lastly, we've taken advantage of um, tablets and iPads because we know that that's kind of where we're going in the future. So we're able to, again, put the power of your data in the palm of your hand by using this new technology. So with that being said, we're going to open it for questions.